What's up everybody, I'm Jason, and welcome back to a quick dive into a just released feature for the ESR5. And that is, today I will be looking at the new auto power off temperature setting that Canon has added in firmware 1.6. Now, since it's released, one of the biggest issues with recording video on the R5 has been the thermally limited recording times that you run into when shooting at high resolutions and high frame rates. In many cases, such as shooting at 8K30 or 4K 120, the camera may not be able to even make a 30 minute long clip. However, at least for me, I'd argue that the real problem isn't that the recording times are shorter than the 30 minute clip length. After all, if you know how long it's going to record, you can work around that. Rather, the problem is that the recording times are variable and unpredictable. The camera may say you'll get 20 minutes, but then when you're shooting, you might get something completely different. Or for that matter, if you were shooting stills, you might not even get 20 minutes when you go to shoot video. And an example of this unpredictability is that when one of my tests while I was shooting this video, the camera predicted that I would have 28 minutes of recording time and I got 48 instead. In any event, the EOS R3, or when Canon released the EOS R3, they included a setting that lets you increase the auto power off temperature from the normal safe standard level. Well, I shouldn't say safe, from the standard level. And that's now included in firmware 1.6 for the EOS R5. Now, R6 owners, sorry, Canon didn't include this in your version 1.6 update. So having been bit by the record anxiety temperature bug, whatever you want to call it, recently, I was quite interested to see how well this works in practice. So you'll find the new auto power off temperature limit at the top of the Shoot 8 menu in Movie Mode. In the menu, you'll find two options, Standard, which was the old normal only behavior, and a new High Level. So to test this new feature, I looked at two recording modes. One was shooting 4K high quality, so that's downsampled from the 8K sensor resolution at 24 frames per second, and the other was 4K at 120 frames per second. Now, I would have liked to have tested more recording modes, but each of these tests require several hours of shooting and cooling for recovery between each test, and that made it prohibitive to do more than a couple of tests, as the firmware was just released two days before I shot this video. And while I would talk about the boring stuff, here are some videos from the test runs to give you an idea of how this plays out. First up will be the 24 frame per second video, and then the 120 frame per second video side by side. So both of these tests were conducted using C-Log3, which means they were both recorded using 10 bits or at 10 bit color depth with 422 chroma subsampling and HEVC compression. Now the 4K 24 frame per second test used IPB compression while the 4K 120 frame per, uh, per, frame per second test used all eye compression. So I chose IPB for compression for the 24 frame per second test as that's what I typically use when I'm shooting just as an effort to manage file sizes so things don't get ridiculously big instantly. During these tests, I kept the LCD open. Partly this was to aid in cooling and getting the most runtime, and partly it was because I frequently shoot this way so it was reflective of a real world scenario. For power, I used USB power delivery during the tests, so I didn't have to worry about battery life. And it turns out it was a good thing that I did that, as I would have run out of battery well before the camera auto shut down in high temperature mode during the 24 frame per second test. For storage, I used a freshly formatted 256 gig UHS-1 SanDisk SD card for the 24 frame per second test and a one terabyte AngelBird AV Pro Mark II CF Express card for the 120 frames per second test. I hadn't planned on doing the 120 frame per second test initially or I would have used the same card for both. All of these tests were controlled with some so custom software that runs through an Arduino that controls the camera in turn through the remote release port. And this software also provided the clock that you see in the recordings and the ability to automatically restart the camera every 25 minutes in 24 frame per second mode or seven and a quarter minutes in 120 frames per second mode with minimal downtime between each or uh, in the recycle essentially giving me continuous recording. 
So during all of the tests, I checked the external temperature at the back of the camera every few minutes with an infrared thermometer. The ambient temperature during all of these tests was about 78 degrees Fahrenheit, plus or minus a degree or so, or around 25.6 degrees Celsius. So this chart here summarizes the temperatures that I measured on the two runs at 24 frames per second. Now, if the labels aren't clear in the video, they might be just tiny. The blue line is the temperature in standard or when the camera is set for standard. And the red line is the temperature for when the camera was set to high. So with auto power off temp set to standard, the camera stabilized at about 99 degrees around the 36 minute mark. This is for the 24 frame per second test, I should add, and then powered off 12 minutes later at 48 minutes of recording. After the camera powered off, I let it sit for what ended up being two and a quarter hours. Unfortunately, I don't know if it recovered faster than that as I got distracted and that was the fastest I could get back to the camera. And in that time, the camera obviously recovered enough that it was returned or it had returned to estimating a record time of 20 minutes again. So for the second round of tests, I set the auto power off temperature setting to high and immediately noted that the estimated record time that you see on the back of the camera jumped to the full 2959 clip length limit instead of the 20 minutes it was estimating previously. So I repeated the temperature measurements for this round as well. This round also started out with the camera one degree warmer than it did in the first run. I'm not entirely sure why. However, after that, it followed the same overall trend and the temperatures agreed very closely. At the 36 minute mark, it had exceeded 99 degrees, which would probably have been close to the shutdown temperature in the standard mode. And then at 48 minutes, it had reached 100.5 degrees and at 60 minutes, it had stabilized at 102 degrees. It stayed at that 102 degrees until I terminated the test some 45 minutes later. As I said, the test ran for one hour and 45 minutes, at which point I stopped the test as the camera's temperature was holding steady. It wasn't going up anymore. And there was no on flashing war or no flashing warnings on the screen about overheating. Plus I was running out of both patience and storage space on the card to keep going. At the end of the test, the camera reported a recording time of 23 and change minutes, which was all the space that was remaining on the card, so it was not obviously thermally limited at that point. So for the second round of tests, I wanted to look at the performance at 120 frames per second. 4K 120 frames per second is one of the most thermally limited modes on the R5, and one that I find I use more than I'd personally like to admit. Now, interestingly, in the 4K 120 frame per second standard test, the camera's external temperature did rise over the 100 degree mark long before the camera shut down. I thought perhaps that 100 degrees would have been the safe external shutdown temperature, but that appears not to be the case. In standard mode, the camera powered off after 17 minutes and 26 seconds of recording. And with the auto power off level set to high, the camera managed to run for 25 minutes and 32 seconds. However, by the end of the high mode, the external temperature measured on the camera was quite toasty at 110 degrees. Now, admittedly, this wasn't a huge comprehensive test, but the results so far do look pretty promising. That said, I was also shooting at low ISOs, and I mention this because of noise. So in the case of the 24 frame per second test, I was shooting at ISO 800, and I was shooting at ISO 3200 for the 120 frame per second test. That said, I didn't see much in diff of a difference in the way of noise. However, at high ISOs, that may be more problematic. Also, I didn't look into recovery times in this test either. It happens to uh, to have slipped my mind while I was performing the tests and given the amount of time that the tests take, it was too late to redo everything just to look at recovery. However, just using the cameras while I was doing the tests, recovery times were significantly faster. After the second 120 frame per second test, my camera showed full clip lengths after being powered off for only five or 10 minutes, whereas in the first 120 frame per second test, it took much longer than that before the camera would show a full clip length available.
Either way, the results here, as I said, do look promising. Now, of course, if Canon would just remove the 30 minute clip length limit, we'd be golden. So that's my early look at some of the data from the R5 firmware 1.6's new auto power off temperature setting. If you found this useful, or at least informative, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, consider subscribing if you're not already. Also, if you know someone who might also find this useful, please consider sharing it with them. It helps them, it helps me, and it makes you look like a hero in the process. Best of all, it's free, and there's not much in life that is. So it's a win all the way around. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.